Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Yes, we're still doing my bedtime book of two-minute stories. It is her bedtime book of two-minute stories. Also, it's a different story every time, so it does have a lot of variety because even the authors are different. Without further ado, my bedtime book of two-minute stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's stories are The Gold Star, by Rosemary Bromley, Daniel the Drake and the Magic Frog by Anna Webb, and Mr. Gobbledygook. Yes, savor that for a moment. Mr. what now? Gobbledygook by Rosemary Garland. I can already hear me listen. That's going to sound weird, but this is how it's in my head. I can already hear myself editing this. <laughs> Uh, how many times I say gobbledygook? <laughs> when we get there, when we get there. Yes. Starting with the gold star. It was Monday morning at the nursery school. Roger walked silently along. This was his first day at school, and though he felt proud of his book bag hanging from his shoulder, he was not at all sure he wanted to stay for a whole morning. At that moment, Roger's friend Christopher, followed by his mother, sped through the gate on his tricycle. Hello, called Christopher. Hi, Chris, answered the new boy. Don't worry, said Christopher. We have lots of fun. You'll like it. Come on. Roger hesitated, looked up at his mother, and swallowed a funny lump in his throat. Goodbye, Mom, he whispered. She smiled. I'll be here for you at noontime, waiting to hear all about it. Mrs. Fisher, who was in charge of the nursery school, was standing at the door. Hello, Roger, she said kindly. I am glad you are joining us. Come along in, dear. Put your overall on, because we shall be painting later this morning. Roger hung up his coat, and Christopher, in a bright green overall, waited for him while he struggled into his scarlet smock. Together, the two friends walked into a room filled with boys and girls making a great deal of noise. There were small-sized tables and chairs and a large notice board. Our paintings are pinned up on that board, explained Christopher. And every morning, the best one has a gold star stuck on it. Oh, said Roger. Mrs. Fisher clapped her hands. Now, children, we are going to sing some nursery rhymes. Sing as loudly as you like, because later, while you are painting, I want you to be quiet as mice. The children gathered round an old piano. Mrs. Fisher played some notes. One, two, three. Now all together, she cried. At first, Roger hardly dared join in. But he loved nursery rhymes, and soon he was singing at the very top of his voice. That was very nice, said Mrs. Fisher. Now off to your tables. Roger, will you sit with Christopher and Lorna, please? She handed each child a large painting brush and a piece of thick white paper. Then she put little tins of red, blue, yellow, and black paint and a jar of water on every table. This morning, she said, I want you to paint something that you have seen during the weekend. I went to the sea, whispered Christopher. I shall paint that. I'm going to paint the swings in the park, said Lorna. Roger looked at his blank white paper. He loved painting, but he felt uncertain. What was he to do? I know. I'll paint the red coal truck I saw on Saturday, he decided. He set to work. He was just finishing the last sack of coal when Mrs. Fisher called. Time to stop, children. She walked slowly around the tables, examining every painting carefully. Roger hung his head and stared at his shoes as Mrs. Fisher looked over his shoulder. As she walked to the notice board, all eyes followed her. Well, children, she said, I have enjoyed your work this morning. Bring your paintings to me one at a time and I will put them up. The board was a rainbow of color as the last picture was pinned on. Now, she said, for the gold star, I'm going to give it to Roger for a very fine first effort. Well done, Roger. She stuck a bright gold star on his painting. Roger's eyes shone with happiness. It will soon be time to tell Mom all about it, he thought. And that was the end of the story? Wow. Also, you know, these stories would probably be about two minutes if they were only one page long. I'm guessing they want you to read a page per minute. Well, that tends to be the average speed. You know, they say when you're writing a script to have it be a page per minute. But a script has a lot more spacing in it than these stories. Yeah, very little description, and the dialogue is kind of spaced 
in such a way that it is about a page per minute. Cause I've written screenplays. <laughs> Nothing you've seen. Nothing you probably want to see. Uh, but the artist, jeez, this artist just nails this. The nice picture here of Roger working on his truck with a little girl in the background wearing her smock. She's wearing a blue dress. And he's wearing a red smock with a white shirt. Oof. Yeah, kids in white and paint class. Not good. I also like how the artist illustrated all the kids' drawings. It They definitely feel like kids' drawings because kids have a tendency to draw very uh, iconically. I, basically, they go for icons instead of the actual thing they see. So it's very simple. It's very flat because of this. Basically, it's the pieces of the file that they use to identify an object, not what the object actually looks like. And she captured that very well. It's kind of abstract, really. It's kind of fun to look at kids' drawings and go, Wow, is that me? No, that one's you. So, so I'm, a, I'm a short, fat man. Well, okay. Well, that makes me so self-conscious now. You did it to yourself. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But yeah, the line work is excellent. The kids are very well done. It's... Um, kind of reminds me of, especially that girl, kind of like a rainbow bright, but more realistic. Oh, and Amber just pointed out to me because I skimmed right over it. The glass of water and the paints are actually drawn in the lower left corner of the left page. And you see those same paints and glasses of water re shown on the tables with the picture of the children working on their pictures. Daniel the Drake and the Magic Frog This is the story of Daniel, a very dashing young drake who lives on a pond in the middle of a village. It's a lovely pond with rushes and reeds and silver birch trees all around it and at one side there's a special place where horses can have a drink if they get thirsty. Daniel looks so warm and happy in his smart clothes but once upon a time he was the most unhappy little drake there ever was. One cold winter day, Daniel was swimming round the pond, in and out of the rushes and reeds. He kept looking up at the cold gray sky, just wishing and wishing for summer to come, so that he could get warm again. Everyone seemed to be warm but Daniel. The village children would come and give him bread and biscuits, and once they even brought a piece of birthday cake, so the young Drake was never hungry. Their red cheeks would glow as they ran about wearing thick woolly mufflers and warm clothes, and Daniel loved to watch them playing games and having such fun. He was only poor little Daniel, who sometimes felt so miserable that the tears would roll down his yellow beak and go plop into the water. On that special afternoon, Daniel was feeling very cold and miserable indeed, just swimming around, when suddenly he heard a sort of croaky noise. With his sharp black eyes, he looked all around. And what do you think he saw? Am I supposed to guess here? Like a frog? Um, no, I was doing an extra long pause, pretending we were children's television. Ah! There, by a clump of reeds, sat a poor old frog holding one foot in the air, croaking very loud indeed. Hello, Mr. Frog, said Daniel. Are you hurt? Hello, Daniel, said the frog. I've hurt my poor foot on a sharp stone, and now I can't swim back to my house. Never mind, said Daniel. Jump on my back and I'll swim you home in a twinkling. So the frog jumped on Daniel's back and off they swam. Soon they reached the place where the frog had his home, and Daniel was just going to say goodbye and get better soon when the frog turned to him and said, I am a magic frog, and because you have been so kind to me, I will grant you a magic wish. Choose the thing you want the most, then go to sleep, and when you wake up in the morning, your wish will have come true. Oh, said Daniel, please, could I have something to keep me warm? I do get so cold in the winter. Oh, Mr. Frog, I would so like to be warm. Of course, said the frog. Off you go now. Sleep soundly, and in the morning when you wake up, you will see that your wish has come true. So Daniel said thank you and good night and swam off feeling very happy and excited. He dreamt a lovely dream, all about Felicity Fieldmouse, 
who often came to sit by the side of the pond while she knitted caps and socks for her children. In the dream, Felicity was knitting things for Daniel, a white sweater with blue stripes, and what else do you think? A lovely cap with a tassel on top. Early the next morning, Daniel awoke feeling very cold, and the first thing he saw on the bank by the side of the pond was a package. Quickly, he swam across to have a look. On the top was a big white label with writing that said, A present for Daniel from the Magic Frog. Very excited, Daniel untied the string with his beak. The paper fell open, and there inside was a white sweater with blue stripes and a lovely cap with a tassel on top. All just like the clothes in his dream. Shaking the water off his feathers, Daniel jumped out of the water. He put on the clothes. They were a perfect fit, of course, and right away he started to feel warm. Soon he was swimming around the pond, singing a song as loud as he could and laughing at the cold gray sky. Perhaps one day, if you are very lucky, you will go to the village, and if you are very lucky indeed, you may see Daniel swimming around, all dressed up in his sweater and cap. What I find interesting is, like, the order of the pictures, like... This is obviously the frog holding his leg that's talked about uh, around here. So I was thinking almost it should be up here and this one should be down here. The other picture I'm indicating is one where the frog's already on his back. And the image of both Daniel and the frog in that image is very realistic where the image of the frog holding up his injured leg looks more cartoonish. Yeah, and the frog is primarily yellow in such a way that it's very hard to see. But I do like the kids over here too. Yes, the first image at the bottom takes up half the first page is Daniel in the pond with several children on the shore. I didn't see that child back there. Looks kind of creepy at first. Because my brain picked up the blushing as eyes and the eyes as eyebrows. Mm, that would be creepy. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's a little creepy anyway, staring right at you. Yeah, yeah, just just a little. But other than the frog, the art's very nice. Just this one shot of the frog is so hard to see because the yellows might just be the age of the book too. The yellow is kind of faded in such a way that you always see is white. Oh, but you still have to wonder because the other images, everything else despite the age of the book and all the conditions it went through before I ever even got a hold of it. Yeah, and I love how that's a yellow sweater with white stripes, but the book describes it as a blue sweater with white stripes, but I understand because the limitations of this artist's decided color palette. Yeah, because this is the yellow and black and gray color palette, so. Also, how do you keep a sweater and a hat with a tassel dry in the water? And I wouldn't call that a tassel. I always grew up calling those pom-poms. A little ball of just fluffy yarn. I don't know what I've heard them referred to as. I just know those kind of hats are kind of warm, and since they're magical, I'm guessing that's how they stay dry. Well, the items themselves aren't necessarily magical. It's what he asked for was a way to stay warm. And if they got wet, would he stay warm? He would be warm anyways, because he's a duck. He's fine. Yeah, ducks get cold too. Shall we continue? Mm-hmm. Oh. One more. Also, so far, no poems. There is in this one. Mr. Gobbledygook. Isn't it Mr. Gobbledygoop? Yes, it's Mr. Gobbledygoop. Okay. I just, when you said at that time, I didn't hear the pee, so I thought I'd make sure. Mother was peeling and slicing the potatoes for lunch. Rebecca and Giles were helping her. Aren't they huge, said Rebecca. You can have one each to play with, said Mother. Okay. I've, I think I may have done that once in school. School? Well, you know, this used to be how the original Mr. Potato Head worked. What can we do with them? asked Giles. You'll think of something, I'm sure, said Mummy. She went from mother to mummy. Well, that's one way to get wrapped up in things. Giles found a very funny shaped potato. Look, it's just like a man, he said. And he stuck matchsticks into the potato to make arms and legs. Then he bent a milk bottle top to make a silvery hat for his little man. There, said Giles, I'm going to call him Mr. Gobbledygook. Rebecca wished her potato looked like a little man. Never mind, said Mother. You've got lots of dolls instead. But what can I do with my potato? asked Rebecca. 
Why not make some clothes for Mr. Gobbledygook, said Mother. But that sounds silly, said Rebecca. How can you make clothes with a potato? Cut the potato in half like this, said Mother. Now use the potato peeler and cut out shapes on the flat side of your potato. Rebecca thought this was lots of fun, but she still didn't see how she was going to make clothes for Mr. Gobbledygook. Now mix a saucer of paint, said Mother. Giles mixed one of blue paint and Rebecca mixed a saucer of red paint and Giles cut out some shapes on the other half of the cut potato. While they were doing this, Mother found a big piece of white cloth. There now, she said. Spread the cloth out and you can print pretty patterns all over it. It was fun! Rebecca printed her red pattern all over the cloth first and when it was dry, Giles printed his blue pattern in between the red pattern. What a pretty pattern it makes, they shouted. Now what do you think you can do with it? asked Mother. Why cut out the cloth and make Mr. Gobbledygook some trousers, shouted Rebecca. And a shirt, said Giles. They were busy. Mother helped with the cutting out. What happened to lunch? I can use my toy sewing machine, said Rebecca. Soon Mr. Gobbledygook's suit was ready. and Rebecca carefully put it on the potato man. He looked so handsome. But Rebecca thought he looked lonely. Let's make a Mrs. Gobbledygook, she said. And that's just what they did. And Mrs. Gobbledygook had a smart potato printed dress, too. How they all laughed. Giles held up Mr. Gobbledygook. And the potato man bowed to Mrs. Gobbledygook and said in a funny low voice, How do you do, Mrs. Gobbledygook? Shall we go for a walk? Then they walked to the window and looked out and had a funny gobbledygook conversation watching all the people go by. Wouldn't you like to make a gobbledygook family one day? Hmm. Little spuds running around. I can think of a lot of things I would rather do with potatoes. <laughs> yeah, I remember in school cutting the potatoes in half and making them into stamps. Mm, yeah, I don't. The art's really nice. And for a second there, I was confused about that particular image in the upper right-hand corner of that page because she looked so bored. But now I know it's her going, oh, he looks lonely. Mm -hmm. Also, if the kids leave those potatoes in the windowsill too long, they might actually grow. Yeah, and just how long did all of this take? Because they had to wait for the cloth to dry before they could do the second pattern. And then they had to wait for the cloth to dry again before they could cut anything. Hmm. Also, back when you could still say, Ooh, I can use my toy sewing machine! And not have everyone look at you like you're crazy. Ah, so, poem? Poem. The Goldfish. Around his bowl the goldfish swims, With great big eyes and golden fins. He hasn't very much to do, Except look out and see the view. I wonder why he grins and grins, When all he does is swims and swims. I've never seen a goldfish grim. Grim. I've never seen a goldfish grin. You probably haven't seen a goldfish grim either. I don't remember coming across that in the series. <laughs> uh, as in grim? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never watched that. So we've finished all three stories. What did you think? <laughs> well, these three I actually remember pretty well. More the images on the gold star than the story. Because mm. that's like a super short story. And same with Daniel, Drake, and the Magic Frog. This one is the one I remember the most out of the three. Hmm. But you remember last time I was kind of thumbing ahead going, Yeah, I remember that one. I remember that one. Let's see, how many stories away are we from Cowslip Keys? One, two, three, four. Oh my goodness. Cowslip Keys is five stories away. So what is that? That's, hmm, that's two episodes from here. Oh well. <laughs> so this has been The Gold Star by Rosemary Bromley, Daniel the Drake and the Magic Frog by Anna Webb, and Mr. Gobbledygook by Rosemary Garland. Okay, we're about a third of the way through the book. <laughs> so... Uh, we double checked. There's still lots of copies on Amazon. Read ahead, read behind, read along. Just want to do some regular shopping on Amazon or you already got this one. We have links to other books in the other episodes. Uh, but anyways, usual please check out the Amazon and Ebates links for shopping. 
Amazon you know, Ebates you might not, get cash back for shopping at stores that you probably shop at anyways. Especially handy during the holidays. Sign up and make a qualifying purchase and get a welcome bonus. Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content in the Lux Analysis channel. But if they ask nicely... If they ask less than nicely, we'd probably still say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for listening.